Sailing Yacht Talisman YouTube channel is about showing the cruising life for what it really is. And as Wendy and I have discovered, there are essentially three areas that must be mastered if you want to do this. The first is sailing and navigation. The second is keeping diesel engines and other equipment running. And the third is maintaining and repairing electrical systems. Initially, this episode was going to be a quick do-it-yourself of a simple swap out of our 24 volt alternator. But I quickly found myself adding note after note of why things are this way or that. It got me thinking that what was really needed was an overview of how sailboat electrical charging systems work, and that is what this is going to be. By necessity, this will be a cursory examination, something to help get viewers up to speed on what's happening with modern battery charging technology. I've tried to keep my diagrams as simple as possible, and I've actually not shown the majority of the electrical systems, such as breaker panels and components like winches and such, in order to just focus on the batteries and charging. First, let's take a look at where the power comes from on our boat. Here I show the external shore power cable that brings in 230 volt power at 50 hertz phasing from a dock mounted pedestal. As I just mentioned, the breaker panels are excluded, so I show it being wired directly into our battery charger. Typical shore power is 16 or 32 amps in Europe, and our boat can handle either. There are alternating current, or AC, phase differences between Euro 50 hertz and American 60 hertz power, and this adds complications for bringing a Euro boat to the US or vice versa. Alternating current is the high speed toggling of positive and negative, and this switching shows as a sine wave. The measurement of each wave is listed in hertz, and practically speaking, feeding the wrong phasing into a system has no effect at all on some components like lighting and small battery charging transformers, but tends to cause motors that are designed for one or the other to run either too weak or to overheat. It's a subject that's too complicated for this video, but you can research it online if you want. So that's the shore power cable. But what if you're not in a marina with electric pedestals? What if you're anchored out? In this case, we have a generator. Again, this is a highly simplified diagram with only 230 volts AC power going out from the generator to the battery charger only. Our generator is a Fisher Panda 6KVA model providing 230 volts, 32 amps, 50 hertz power. And this feeds our internal wall sockets, water heater, and refrigeration. It also runs our MasterVolt 2475 battery charger as shown. This charger maintains charging of the 24 volt house bank, battery, bank of batteries and effectively converts 230 volts AC power to 24 volts DC. These house batteries provide domestic electric supply for lighting, navigation, and other non-engine or gen set starting needs. For engine and gen set starting, we have separate batteries. A third source of power is obviously the alternators. Alternators provide DC or direct non-oscillating current this isn't meant to meet the high AC current demands of the big equipment, but will certainly keep up with 12 and 24 volt battery banks we have on board. So one might ask, why would you have both 12 and 24 volt battery banks? Why is one preferable over the other, or even required? The short answer is current, or amps. When DC power is run through wires, these wires can heat up dramatically if they aren't sized properly. Also. As the wires heat up, resistance grows, thus reducing the actual voltage and current available to whatever piece of equipment is being powered. The longer the run, the larger these wires must be. And as boats get bigger, these runs necessarily get longer. The wires feeding our bow thruster are over half an inch of stranded copper just to carry that load. So back to 12 versus 24 volts. It turns out there's a cool relationship between volts and amps. When you double voltage, you can have the amps and still get the same power. Wattage is the expression of this relationship, and you get watts by multiplying volts times amps. Therefore, you get the same wattage, 24 volts times 7 amps, as you do at 12 volts times 14 amps. This allows our bow thruster to operate off the 24 volt house bank of batteries, even though they're over 25 feet away. Whereas, if it was a 12 volt version, we'd have to have a separate battery installed next to the unit. The run would be untenable otherwise. I should add that there are a lot of undersized bow thrusters and windlasses out there because of this limitation. So let's look at another interesting aspect, the DC side of our electrical design. Here on the diagram, you can see the eight batteries that make up our house battery bank. Most electronics and lighting run off low voltage DC power since fire, shock hazard, and power generation requirements are so significantly reduced. Each of these batteries is six volts. 
and the amp hours for each battery are calculated by the manufacturer. Electric consumption for fixtures and equipment is calculated in what are called amp hours. So when calculating your electric consumption needs, you make a chart. On the one side you have the power draw by fixture listed in amp hours, and on the other side will be power available from the batteries, also listed in amp hours. These batteries produce 180 amps each at 5 hours and 210 amp hours each at 20 hours. This basically tells you that you get more amps if you draw them out slowly instead of fast. Now let's look at the batteries themselves. You'll note that the top row of batteries is connected positive to negative. This is called running in series. When you do this, the voltage of each battery is additive. Therefore, 6 volts times 4 batteries equals 24 volts. Amp hours remain 180 and 210. Now we can add the lower bank of batteries, also run in series, and connect the two by running the two positive cables together at the one end and doing the same with the negative cables at the other. This is called running in parallel. When you do this, the voltage remains the same, but the amp hours are added. So 180 becomes 360 amp hours and 210 becomes 420. The setup you see here is often called series parallel to denote the combination. Also, while it's kind of self-evident that it would be cool to keep two separate battery banks for both house and engine starts, since that way you wouldn't accidentally run down your engine start battery by leaving the lights on, there's actually more to it. Here we get into the realm of different types of batteries for differing purposes. As I alluded to a second ago, let's talk about battery technology. While our engine and gen set batteries are regular lead acid batteries like we've seen all our lives, the house batteries are different. These are deep cycle batteries. Whereas the engine and gen set batteries are designed to produce high cold cranking amps for short bursts, if you draw these batteries down to less than half their rated power more than a few times, they'll stop holding a charge will be ruined. Deep cycle batteries, on the other hand, are made to be able to be drawn down repeatedly. You don't want to completely kill them, but they'll tolerate being taken pretty far down as a normal condition. Batteries typically come in what are called lead acid, gel, and AGM, or absorbed glass mat. The benefit of the gel and AGM batteries is that they recharge faster, and ours are the gel variety. Lithium ion batteries are also coming onto the market, and once they become common, I doubt anyone will ever want to go back. But these batteries require careful charging, very careful charging, and it's doubtful that non-specific battery chargers and alternators will be compatible. And this brings us to the charge controllers. And the diagrams have separated out the charge controllers, even though they're mostly integrated into the battery charger and alternators. I did this to show the importance of charge controlling since the new styles of batteries require very specific charging curves and this is not something that was available in the old style battery chargers or alternator voltage regulators. Lead acid batteries are pretty tolerant of whatever's out there, but gel, AGM, and certainly lithium ion are not going to be like that. You'll cook your batteries if you aren't careful. In fact, when we bought our boat and purchased a gel style set of batteries, we discovered that our old master volt charger from back in the day was overcharging them. This required a new charger, which was a very expensive proposition. Something too that bears mentioning is that moving from incandescent to LED lighting is a fantastic way to reduce power needs. By swapping out Talisman's headliner lighting and reading lights to LED, which we initially did just by ordering new bulbs, we reduced current draw by a factor of 10. Now, with all the lights on in the boat, we draw just over one amp of power. We have enough power stored in our 480 amp hour house battery bank to run the boat with autopilot, all navigation equipment, and typical lighting and electric winch and electric furler use for over 10 days with no recharging. Finally, let's talk about solar and wind generators. These are similar to alternators in that they produce power just by being on, and you can't just go hooking these up to a battery. They need charge controllers too. In order to manage the power being produced, they need to feed it to the batteries if needed, or dump to ground or otherwise disengage if the batteries are full. So that's the quick and dirty on charging and battery systems aboard Talisman. This is a subject that will generate questions, and while I'm no marine electrician, I'll answer what I can. Long-term viewers will know that I make it a policy to give real replies to comments, plus we'd love to drive our subscriber numbers upward if we can. This is a channel that produces a new video every week, more or less, so we do take it seriously. Detour for a moment and go click the subscribe and like buttons, then shoot us a comment if you see something worth commenting on. Oh, and let's get on with the alternator swap. That's what started this whole thing. So today's task is to replace the 24 volt alternator on our Yanmar engine with this new 24 volt 
alternator, which is the same brand and model of what we have. So it should be a direct swap. I will start by saying that I damaged the existing alternator by stupidly turning off the isolator switch to the engine while it was running. Um, I did this because the solenoid was stuck. The stop solenoid wasn't working and I, I was looking for a way to try to stop the engine when the other, when the stop switch didn't work um, up on the binnacle. And so don't do that. Don't ever turn an isolator off while an alternator is running because you remove the grounding um, function and the, the, the electricity that's being produced has no place to go and it burns it out. Burns out, I don't know, diodes or something inside. So anyway, that's, that's what happened. Second thing is Oyster. Oyster. Oyster supplied us with this alternator and I have to say they, they, the pricing on it was better than anything I could find on the internet. They do a fantastic job of taking care of their customers and as a manufacturer I suspect they get better pricing than the distributors do. Um, so they pass that on and in many cases we've bought a bunch of stuff from Oyster and in every case their price has been at least equal to what you could find on the internet and oftentimes it was for parts that you couldn't even get on the internet. Um, they have a great supply of stuff for the boats that they've produced over the many years including this one um, which is not a brand new boat by any stretch. Um, so props to, to Oyster. Uh, moving on to tools. Here I have kind of arrayed out for display for video kind of what this is the tool selection just for sockets and spanners combination wrenches more specifically. You need a lot of this type of stuff when you're on a boat if you're going to do your own work. You need a tool for almost everything that you could possibly need and so here we have the blue um, stripped uh, sockets are, are metric and the red ones are SAE. We have deep well sockets, we've got half inch drive sockets, three eighths inch drive sockets, quarter inch drive sockets, we've got in metric and SAE we've got hex drivers, um, we've got the extension, ex socket wrench extension in extenders as needed, um, various bits. Um, here's a selection of socket wrenches and converters to go from half to three-eighths and three-eighths to quarter so on. These are Torx drivers, not used too often but when you need one you really you really need the exact thing. Um, and I'm going to be using this DeWalt miniature impact driver to hopefully get the nut off the old one and they did, they did not include a, the pulley so I'm going to have to try to can pull the pulley off the old one and put it onto here which I'm a little bit worried about. Pulleys have a strong tendency to seize themselves onto shafts and we do not have easily available right now a, a pulley puller, gear puller. As far as combination wrenches go, you know this is just the metric supply. There's another bag with full, filled with SAE. But here I've marked some of the some of the more commonly used ones. This 24 millimeter wrench uh, we use whenever we have to move a dock cleat. A lot of the pontoons in Europe use um, kind of a standardized cleat system that has has big 24 uh, millimeter nuts on it, and, and you can actually move the cleats in the track, and that helps sometimes uh, if you're trying to tie your boat up exactly the way you want. We also I also have these two wrenches, the 13 and 17 millimeter wrenches, kind of taped with blue tape because that, those are the most common sizes here on this boat. Um, and um, again, it's nice that they kind of standardized on a couple of sizes because it really makes life easy. Um, but um, so let's, let's jump to it and get this job done.
need. Okay, so I need to, I need to, um, this, this wrench here, mm -hmm. I'm going to come around and just hold it, and then it, it's going to need to be loosened um, after I get to the other side and put a, put a combination wrench on the other side of the bolt. Okay. I don't know which side has the nut on it. Do you have it, is it ready to loosen or is it? It's tight? already loosened, um, but it's spinning on this side, I'm pretty sure. Okay. Um, I'm going to try, try turning it. Okay, let me just put this in there. This is the bolt side, so. Now, when that comes off, mm -hmm. the nut will be inside that long um, socket, okay. that deep well socket. Yep. And so, um, you want to not tip it forward so it can drop out. Yep. Okay, so back it up now. Pull the, pull the wrench, uh, press the little button on the end of the wrench and pull it off the end of that, that that shaft, that um, extender, yeah, and there, and just move the wrench away. I'm going to turn it by hand after the wrench is off. Press the little button in the center on the top, and then it'll, it'll, it'll release it. Yeah. Those are still in there. Let's pull it back the nut off the end of it, and uh, Tap it against something and see if it, see there, you're fine. Okay, with that lip, uh, damn it! What's it touching that it's doing it, that to It touched something over here. All right, let's, let's do this. Let's put a glove around it. Wow, I could have saved myself some embarrassment by just cutting this clip out of the, out of the episode, but I'm not going to do that because um, this is the type of thing that happens uh, when you don't fully understand the systems. Um, this is me being foolish. I could have checked this with a voltmeter easily enough beforehand, and but I but I made the erroneous assumption that turning off all the battery isolators would actually isolate everything from the batteries, and I've subsequently learned that that's not the case. That that the, at least the pa the positive lead um, on the on the alternator runs directly to the batteries, and and actually the the negative lead uh, grounds at least at the time of this uh, um, video uh, footage, it, it grounded directly to the, to the engine block. And that's a, a possible reason why our anode on the prop um, dissolved so quickly, that pretty much any time the engine was running and the, and the battery bank was full, it was basically discharging um, all the electric, electricity being produced into into the block and probably through the transmission and the shaft and out to the propeller. And although the engine has a, a grounding wire that goes to a grounding plate on the bottom of the boat, power um, and current uh, follow the path of least resistance always in, in, in electrical wiring diagrams. And if there's even the slightest um, easier path going in one direction, the electricity will go that way. Um, I have subsequently rewired the negative side of the alternator to run through a 500 amp shunt and back into the battery bank directly. Um, and it also, the, the battery bank itself has, a, has a, um, a grounding wire running to the grounding plate on the bottom of the boat. So any additional electricity um, doesn't uh, go. Uh, there, there is a charge controller on this whole thing to make sure that it doesn't just keep on trying to overcharge the batteries. Uh, but the, the, these are complicated systems and um, a lot of people mistake voltage and amperage. They don't quite understand that voltage um, isn't what shocks you. I mean, it kind of, it feels like a shock, but, but it won't, but, but, the, but the danger side is actually on the amps, the current side. So an electric fence on a farm will carry 200,000 volts, but it'll have very low amperage behind it. And so it'll, it'll give you a good shock, but it won't hurt you. Conversely, um, you know, a, a 480 volt system um, or even like a 110 volt system back in the United States uh, with uh, say 50 amps behind it will absolutely kill you. Uh, so you have, to, uh, you have to be very, very careful uh, with making sure you know what kind of electricity you're dealing with. Another little side point that I should make is that this little spark that you saw a second ago was carried enough juice to, to, to spot weld the linkage 
uh, between our throttle and the engine and that I was, later on I was able to, to start the engine but then I couldn't get the throttle to move into either forward or reverse and it took me a little while to fi figure out what had happened. I went down there and started looking at that linkage and realizing that it was fused. I was able to take a screwdriver and kind of kind of um, push the two plates apart from one another and they, they snapped apart and I sanded them down a little and put some, some grease on there just to make sure everything uh, moved properly but that's that's what happens when you when you when you run lots of current through um, through through metal plates DC current is very very powerful What do you think? Is it going to work? Or? Well, I'm hoping so. Um, it's a slightly different setup than what was there. Um, but Seems like you can get it on. Yeah, it seems like I can get it on. Do you need any lube or anything? No. no. is whether it's aligned properly hmm. you know uh, the, the belt and everything but this is yeah. going back on the same way as what was there before okay so i'm gonna um, give it a try and see anyway which is good? not good no. let's see here let's see if we can't okay my conversations well so here's the other downside of cruising is that is that you can injure yourself easily the doctors pulled this toenail off so there's no toenail um, but as you can see the toe itself is badly infected uh, and it takes forever to heal on a boat it's just, it just does so I'm on heavy doses of antibiotic they started me on intravenous antibiotics now I'm on oral antibiotics and it just sucks because now there's no swimming there's no even moving around we're stuck here in the harbor until until this gets even a little bit better and there just seems like one thing after the next is preventing us from going someplace if it's not a part for the boat that we have to order it's it's, it's some sort of injury um, so just a word to the wise on that mm -hmm. 